Hello, welcome to this virtual community open house. We're just going to wait a few seconds to let the attendees join the meeting um, and then we'll begin the meeting. All right, I think, think we can get started pretty soon here. Um, I'll kick it off. So I'm Sarah Course, City Planner with Community Planning and Development. Um, and I'd like to kick off this virtual community open house for the Stadium District Master Plan Implementation. Um, before I go any further, I would like to introduce Councilwoman Jamie Torres and pass it on to her for some welcoming remarks. So let's see if we can pass the torch to her. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for kicking off. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's um, uh, exciting to get a new update, um, particularly as uh, you're all moving forward. And um, uh, I know there's a lot of anticipation about what's going to be here. So thank you, everybody, for joining today and for participating and for just staying so involved in what's going to be a really important development here. Um, so thank you, Sarah. I'll hand it over back to you. Thanks. And just to confirm, um, if one of the panelists can say that they can see my screen or not. Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Just have to double check every time. <laughs> All right. So um, I like to go over the setup for the meeting first. Um, so we are all part of the Zoom webinar um, where there'll be a presentation with slides uh, shared on the screen as well as a live polling section. All attendees are automatically muted right now to eliminate any background noise. However, you do have the capability to submit questions through the Q&A chat. Um, and we welcome you to submit your questions and city staff will do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, once we have answered a question in the Q&A, then it will become visible to the entire group. So we ask that you submit questions and comments that will advance the conversation um, and are appropriate for public viewing. Towards the end of the meeting, there will also be an opportunity for a few attendees to ask their question verbally, so out loud. Um, we'll, we'll give speaking capabilities to you. Uh, so if you'd like to ask your question live at the end, please raise your hand and use that raise hand feature. So this meeting is being led by Community Planning and Development, uh, which is the department I'm involved in. But I'd like to recognize all the city staff that's currently on this um, video call today. Um, they are making themselves available to help answer any questions and to contribute to the conversation. So we have community planning and development here today. We also have someone from Parks and Rec, uh, Denver Economic Development and Opportunity, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, Department of Finance, and uh, Department of Housing Stability. So keep those um, city staff in mind if you have any questions for them. All right, so this presentation will cover the project overview, tools and strategies to implement the master plan, other steps to achieving the master plan vision, a live polling session, um, and an open question and answer session. And lastly, we'll have a reminder of next steps for this project. All right, so project overview. Let's take a step back and look at the big picture from creating a plan to hoping to see physical development in the end. Step one involved creating the Stadium District Master Plan, which was adopted by City Council in June 2019. We are currently at step two, where we are establishing new or updated rules and regulations to apply to the master plan area. Following this phase, the property owner can apply for a rezoning. Step three is also when development agreements would be finalized, which would include commitments for affordable housing and other neighborhood benefits. Finally, step four is where the property owner can submit plans for construction to result in development that we all can see and enjoy for years to come. So the project purpose is to implement the recommendations of the Stadium District Master Plan. 
The project more specifically includes identifying and applying more current zoning and design standards and guidelines. Essentially, this project will identify new rules or regulations that will apply to future development when that development happens. These new or updated rules and regulations will generally apply to the stadium district master plan boundary, which is outlined in the black dashed line um, in the image on the right. Similar to the planning process, this current effort involves an evaluation phase, a drafting phase, and an adoption phase. We are currently in the evaluation phase and are looking for feedback from you on potential zoning and design approaches. The city is responsible for leading this particular project right now, whereas other development processes led by the developer are also linked to the adoption timing. All right, let's take another step back. As a reminder, the Stadium District Master Plan was adopted in June 2019. And that plan set the long range vision and guiding principles for the area south of the Broncos football stadium. It was a collaborative effort led by the city with input from the stadium investment corporation, the steering committee and the community. The master plan is considered a policy document, meaning it sets the framework under which future implementation decisions are made, things we will discuss today. The plan identified recommendations and strategies in four major categories land use and built form, mobility, quality of life infrastructure, and community benefits. The focus of the zoning and design guidelines project is on the land use and built form recommendations of the plan. As a reminder, the plan called for allowing a diverse mix of uses, encouraging development that supports Sun Valley and provides opportunities, integrating affordable housing, promoting a variety of building heights and intensities, including taller buildings up to 20 to 30 stories that are slender and also provide affordable housing and also promoting a pedestrian oriented and active street level. Let's move on to the tools and strategies we'll discuss. So the process. To implement the master plan, first we, the city, evaluate the plan's recommendations and strategies. Then we analyze and identify tools that can achieve the plan's vision. Next, we study and receive feedback on how successful tools are, and then finally we adopt tools so they are ready to apply to future development. This presentation focuses on the tools that are potentially best suited to achieve the plan vision and receiving your feedback on if you agree or disagree. So what are the tools that have been identified or that we would like to propose? The approach is to apply enhanced zoning and design tools that are stronger than those found in most parts of the city. These enhanced tools will be applied in two different ways. Updating the Denver zoning code, so appropriate zone districts and rules can be applied to the entire site, and applying a rigorous design review process to ensure better design outcomes can be achieved through, um, can be achieved than just through zoning alone. All right, so, Zoning can achieve the goal of encouraging a diverse mix of uses within a variety of building heights and intensities. So specific zoning strategies would be to encourage a combination of mixed use zone districts with different height maximums and to create a new zone district that allows taller, more slender buildings. The diagram on the right shows an example of what may be appropriate maximum building height ranges that are consistent with the master plan including the community's desire for the buildings to step down toward the river and Old West Colfax Avenue, where the lower five to 12 stories is shown. When we consider the different height ranges, these images provide only just one example of what potential buildings could look like in the lower, medium, and higher ranges. So zoning can also achieve the plan's recommendations for taller, slender buildings that allow more sunlight, air, and views. Specific zoning strategies would be to utilize a point tower building form. This form has strict size limitations for the building size above five stories and requires a minimum separation distance between towers. So let's take a look at what this means. In general, our current zone districts allow more of a boxy building, like the image on the left and the diagram, diagrammatic example on the right. 
However, if enhanced zoning that utilizes the point tower building form were applied here, it could result in a building more similar to the images shown here. Zoning can also achieve the plan goal of shaping boxy buildings and encouraging a variety of building outcomes. So specific zoning strategies would include requiring a standard called mass reduction for buildings that are taller than five stories. Generally, the taller the building gets, the greater the area that must be reduced. You can see the area in red outlines where this tool has been applied and where the upper floors would have been if there was no requirement at all. So let's take another look at what this means. Back to this image. In general, again, current zone districts allow a more boxy building like this image. However, if enhanced zoning that requires mass reduction were applied here, it could produce a building more similar to the images shown. So zoning can also support activating the street and contributing to a pedestrian oriented experience. This can be achieved through several stat strategies, which I'll discuss. The first is by increasing the amount of transparency required at the street level. Transparency is a measurement of the amount of transparent windows or doors on the ground floor. So essentially, we want to encourage more visibility from the street into a building and vice versa from the building out onto the street. Zoning can also support an active street by requiring setbacks and allowing an opportunity for more space between the building and sidewalk. So setbacks and build to standards determine where the building can be located relative to the street and the sidewalk. Another strategy would be to allow small publicly accessible open spaces as an alternative to buildings being directly adjacent to the sidewalk. Another main strategy that we'll discuss today to achieve the goal of active streets is to require non-residential active uses along a portion of the building at the street level. This means we would encourage uses such as retail, restaurants, and office space at the street level for the community to enjoy. So finally, in addition to enhanced zoning tools, design standards and guidelines are proposed for this area and will be applied through a robust design review process. DSGs incorporate a more qualitative design expectations um, that zoning alone cannot achieve. So some of the additional items DSGs may address are enhancing the street level experience, creating richness in architectural massing, detailing and materials, and activating the streets adjacent uses with complementary design elements. In summary, here's a diagram of how this combination of tools would guide future development. So mixed use zone districts will establish the minimum requirements for development, then enhanced zoning tools will add to or modify the base zoning in important aspects related to building shaping and active uses. And finally, the design stairs and guidelines add that last nice layer of more qualitative design and land use expectations for future projects. All right, so we realize there are other items and steps that need to occur to achieve the vision of the plan. And I'll discuss a few of these things today. So as you're aware, the state and district is interested in moving forward with potential development. Uh, uh, they had a community information meeting that was held last November where the stadium district shared their conceptual development proposal. And this past August, the stadium district gave an update on what their conceptual plan is. Affordable housing also remains an important component of the master plan and any future development in this area. A development agreement between the city and property owner or developer will be the mechanism used to achieve the affordable housing goals here. The master plan also identified specific goals and recommendations for streets, bicycle and pedestrian connections, and open space. So these goals will be achieved in a few different ways. First, there is a minimum requirement of 10% public open space across the entire area. The final network, scale, and character of open space amenities will be developed through the infrastructure master plan, which is a document submitted to the city by the property owner or developer. It essentially establishes the overall network of roads, utilities, and that open space. Um, so the infrastructure master plan is something that must be approved by the city uh, before any individual development projects can move forward. 
And lastly, there may also be additional requirements for open space and the mobility network that could be included in a potential development agreement. There are also community benefits that still remain important. And these may be achieved through a community benefits agreement, which is led by the community and is an agreement between the community and the property owner or developer. So additionally, the old city hall view plane covers most of the project area. A view plane is an ordinance to preserve views, usually from various parks and public spaces uh, by limiting building heights. The old city hall view plane was enacted in 1988 and has its point of origin near 14th Street and Larimer Street. And it stretches to the Southwest, including the project area and ends at Federal Boulevard. So this view plan was also modified in 1999 to include an exception for the football stadium. The view plan also covers a portion of the Auraria Higher Education Center, also known as Auraria Campus, which is a state entity and is not required to comply with city, uh, city building height restrictions. Um, so the area outlined in blue or teal that you see are areas where buildings already exceed or could exceed the view plan's um, height restrictions. So as I mentioned, since a rare campus doesn't necessarily have to follow the building height limitations, um, over time, many campus buildings now block the mountain view from its origin point at the old city hall bell. So in addition, Auraria campus has several proposed buildings, um, which are outlined on the image that could potentially the block, block the view even further. And lastly, there are also several citywide plans that have policies supporting taller buildings near transit, including the areas around Decatur Federal Station, Auraria West Campus Station, and Empower Field at Mile High Station. There are also three small area plans with recommendations for heights taller than the view plan restriction. Two of these plans, like the State and District Master Plan, recommend reevaluating the effectiveness of the old City Hall view plan in light of a desire to support other city or neighborhood goals, such as affordable housing. So at this point, I'm going to take a break from talking and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Christopher Johnson, who will help facilitate this live polling. And then after that, we will have an open-ended question and answer session. So Christopher, take it away and I'll start the, getting the polling section ready. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I will lead you through, hopefully, uh, a series of, of questions. We only have four or five here um, to get some, uh, some preliminary um, feedback from you. And, uh, and also, um, the good news is we'll have plenty of time, I think, here after this polling um, to have a conversation and have an open Q&A session to be able to answer your questions. Uh, and we can go back to some of the slides uh, in case there's anything that, that folks want to learn a little bit more about. So uh, as far as testing the polling, this is uh, all sort of new to many of us. So we thought we would um, try the Zoom polling feature and it looks like folks are doing pretty well with that. There should be a little window that pops up in front of you and you should be able to uh, take your vote on cats and dogs. I know my preference, but uh, I, will, I will keep that to myself. We just included this as a testing question to make sure that uh, make sure that everything's working and that folks are are able to respond. Just to double check, uh, do people see the polling results? I know I can see it. All right. So let's go to the first. Uh, let's go to this first question then. Um, so Sarah talked about uh, and and mentioned, you know, through the master plan process, one of the things that we heard from the community and from the stakeholders was to ensure that this area has a variety of different building heights and intensities. Um, generally speaking, taller buildings towards the center, uh, maybe some shorter buildings along Old West Colfax and then also transitioning down towards uh, the communities on the west and south uh, and north of the site here. Um, so what we've shown in this diagram and what Sarah touched on earlier uh, is this is just sort of a conceptual schematic of, 
of how those building heights and range of maximum building heights might be framed up uh, around, uh, around this uh, location and around this development. So the question here is, do you agree or disagree that these potential height maximums uh, are reflective of the goals of the plan? So you can vote with one to strongly disagree, somewhere in the middle or strongly agree. So what we're hoping to uh, achieve here is to you know get some feedback from you to understand if we are headed in the right direction in terms of our interpretation of all the comments that came through the master plan uh, and that those can then be translated to zone districts that would be compatible uh, and, and reinforce the recommendations and strategies in the plan. So we have about 77 total attendees. We have about 55 votes in, so a few more. All right, we'll give folks just a few more seconds. <clears throat> All right, great, thanks, Sarah. So hopefully everybody can see sort of that, uh, the results here generally, it looks like general agreement that we're certainly in the ballpark uh, from somewhat agree up to the strongly agree, not too many on the call uh, at least that disagree that, that these, are, these are out of, uh, out of range of, of where the master plan has been established, that's good news. All right, so on to the second question. Um, Sarah talked about, uh, you know, we have a lot of existing tools in the Denver Zoning Code uh, that, that, you know, work today in a lot of areas, but we feel like there is a need for some enhanced tools and strategies that should be applied here to really encourage this notion of breaking down the scale of buildings and encouraging more sunlight and air to penetrate down to the street and create that more pedestrian oriented experience. So of the, of the tools, do you agree or disagree that these enhanced strategies that, that Sarah touched on earlier um, will help encourage and achieve those goals of sunlight, air and pedestrian oriented experience? We've got about, about 59, 60 responses. So I'll give folks a few more seconds. And I see we're still getting a number of questions in the Q&A, so that's great. Uh, as we get through the polling, uh, we'll be able to shift back to typing up some answers for you. Uh, and then some of those we may, we may just address here verbally through the Q&A session. Okay, so uh, good, similar, similar outcomes here. It looks like we are, we're generally in the ballpark here as far as some enhanced zoning strategies that, that we can utilize going forward to ensure that these buildings are shaped uh, and not, not simply boxes going forward. So on this next question, this is somewhat similar, um, but really what we're trying to talk about here is kind of a combination uh, almost of the two questions, thinking about achieving the plan goals of uh, a variety of different building types and sizes and scales and intensities by using this range of mixed use zone districts and, uh, and these enhanced zoning strategies. So we want to get some feedback 
and uh, some input from you as to as to whether or not you agree or disagree that this combination of these two strategies will will lead to those outcomes. All right, we've got about 60 or so out of 78. So I'll give folks a few more seconds. And then we've got one more question before we kind of move into uh, some more informal discussion and Q&A. OK, good. Continuing in the right direction, this is uh, this is good for us to hear, uh, certainly, that we're not completely off base here, <laughs> that we're doing our job and listening to you. Uh, OK, so the last question then. Uh, so the last question then gets to this idea of the street level and the activity at that street level and how critical and important that is, um, certainly to the success of this of this place uh, going forward as a complete neighborhood, um, but certainly also as as we've heard throughout this entire process over the last couple of years to develop the master plan and then now as we move forward. Um, so we're looking at you know, making sure that we have the right tools in place and these enhanced strategies to ensure that, uh, that we have a lot of transparency and windows and doors at the ground level, that we have a lot of non-residential active uses, so commercial activity at that ground floor in combination with residential, uh, and then the opportunity for these public gathering spaces uh, through, through open space or setbacks and, and really enhancing that um, that streetscape area and that interface between the street and the building. So the question here is, do you agree that this combination of strategies will move the uh, guide the development towards uh, activated streets and an active street level? Couple more seconds. I'm just reviewing some of the Q and A here. All right. So again, uh, good direction from all of you, and and it looks like we are we are moving in the right uh, towards the right pathway. So that is fantastic. That's good news. So at this point, I think what we can do is uh, is open this up um, to some to some Q and A. Um, there's a couple of comments, a couple of questions, questions in the Q&A panel um, that, uh, that I can speak to uh, and talk about uh, here right off the bat. And then if anybody has a question that they would like to ask verbally, um, feel free to use that raise your hand feature uh, and then we can come back to you uh, after we get through a few of these questions in the Q&A here. Um, so there were a couple of questions about um, 
about the affordable housing and uh, relative to the development agreement um, uh, being with the developer or with the property owner uh, and uh, as to how that development agreement is, is recorded or formalized. So uh, the development agreement is something is a, is a legally binding agreement that is entered into between the, between the property owner and uh, and the city, um, and so you're, it's correct that that ends up uh, that ends up actually getting uh, it does get formalized and recorded against the property. So if the property ownership changes, or if a developer comes in to build on that property, uh, they are then uh, they are then beholden to that development agreement as well. So. So the development agreement essentially runs with the land uh, so that any, any future uh, applicant would have to abide by those rules um, and meet those standards in, in the development agreement. Let's see, there was also a question about um, Question about the view plane and uh, and the development heights that we were showing uh, in that diagram, and whether or not the heights or the height of those buildings would need need to stay within the view plane. Um, that's a you know that is a um, a very good question, and that's why that's why Sarah brought that up uh, and and wanted to uh, you know provide some information there. So currently, the view plane uh, height limitations would be lower than what we were showing in that diagram. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, certainly is a challenge there in terms of balancing the amount of development that might be required in order to provide the substantial affordable housing and parks and open space and all of the, all of the sort of vision elements and the neighborhood and community benefits uh, that are identified in that master plan uh, if the development needed to stay below those height limits. And so that's, that's a, a future step for us to consider and, and there will be uh, further outreach uh, and you know, uh, uh, opportunities for public input on that process to better understand how or if that, uh, that view plane uh, needs to be modified to enable um, those neighborhood benefits that, uh, that are so important. I can help answer a question real quick. So far, I don't see any hands up so far. So if you guys want to answer or ask a question live or a comment, um, feel free to raise your hand and we'll uh, assign you speaking capabilities. So one of the questions I was trying to type up, but I'll just answer it now. Uh, it was, will the recommendations from this plan impact the West Area Plan or will that plan impact this plan? So the State and District Master Plan is already completed and was adopted uh, just over a year ago. And whereas the West Area Plan is ongoing, since the Stadium District Master Plan is fairly recent and has some of the most recent recommendations and strategies and input from the community, um, it's sort of informing the West Area Plan's progress. However, the West Area Plan still has their own community outreach um, and it, its boundaries stretch far beyond the Stadium District Master Plan. It covers about six other neighborhoods in that area. Um, so as we move forward, both area plans would still apply, and I think we will work with the West Area Plan team to identify, um, you know, if there's any potential areas of conflict, kind of how that might work out. But um, long story short, both both plans will still apply. Uh, Sarah and Sarah Nermella, if you are available, there was a question about. Um, and perhaps, uh, perhaps Councilwoman Torres, uh, you can chime in as well if possible. But there was a question about um, the. Uh, oops, I just lost it here. Oh, to talk a little bit more about the community partnerships uh, that have been mentioned and how adjacent neighborhoods can participate. Uh, and this might be in reference to kind of the community benefits agreement and um, how that process moves forward. Sure, this is Sarah Normala, and I apologize, I'm in a car, I had to run somewhere. So um, if I, if you lose me, please feel free, free to uh, fill in. Um, so it is our intention as the city to uh, work as productively as possible with our council members, our the community partners, the development community as well, 
um, to be able to um, facilitate those conversations. The community benefits agreement is primarily a discussion between the developer and the community partners. And um, we have been in conversation with uh, the West Side Community Collaborative and will continue to um, be in conversation with them as well as our city council members um, in terms of providing them with information that will um, help guide their conversations with the developer. But we are very limited in terms of the extent of information with respect to the development agreement that goes out. So our intention is to find a way to collaborate with, um, with all of our partners to be able to, again, make their discussions more productive. I know it sounds kind of <laughs> broad, but uh, we, for, for example, we've worked with um, the WSCC to just help them uh, clarify what, what uh, elements they are looking to see in the development may already be covered by what we're uh, negotiating and uh, covering within the infrastructure master plan, for example. So those kinds of conversations just help narrow down and focus the conversations between the developer and the community. I don't know if uh, council member Torres wants to add as well. Not a ton to add. Thank you, Sarah, for, for that. The uh, community coalition that's been working on identifying what kinds of things they'd like to see are still doing that. And they continue to work through the summer and I think are looking forward to um, uh, meeting uh, and starting to have conversation with uh, the district and to really see where that can go. And it's been helpful to connect with uh, CPD as the infrastructure master plan moves forward to make sure that it jives with exactly what they're going to be asking for when it comes to um, uh, whether it's business engagement and opportunity, um, some of the open space needs and desires of the community, some access questions that they have uh, before they really get into um, any of the other community uh, benefit agreement uh, provisions. So, and if um, I don't know if Jean or anyone else from the coalition is on, if they're interested in sharing, I'm sure they can add that to the chat as well. Yeah, Jean, if you if you want to, or anybody from that group wants to say uh, wants to say anything about that, um, use the raise your hand function, and then I can I can uh, promote you. There you go, Jean. You might be muted, Jean, but I gave you the ability to speak. Hopefully, that works. Hi. Hi, I'm Jean Granville. I am a member of the West Side Stadium Community Coalition. I'm also president of the Sun Valley Community Coalition, the registered RNO. And so, yes, a group of us have meeting, been meeting of residents and uh, equity oriented businesses and government organizations for quite a while now. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of a, uh, just a link. If people want any more information, you can just contact us through an email, but we're also in the process of getting out um, information, particularly to the west side, because um, we know that that will be the most immediate and the greatest impact, but we are available to talk with anybody about some of the work we've been doing. Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, there, let's see, let me see if I can continue to <clears throat> uh, hit a few of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, there was a question about the Colfax Viaduct and whether or not that was uh, sort of integrated into this project or into this thinking, and, and the answer is, is very much yes. Uh, the stadium district property uh, extends to the south of the viaduct there um, towards, uh, towards Lakewood Gulch. Uh, and so that, um, you know, envisioning what that viaduct can be in the future is, is certainly part of this process uh, and is, is part of the thinking as we go into this. Uh, let's see, there were a 
another, there were a couple of questions about transparency as well at the street level. And uh, one comment was, of course, that um, too much transparency can actually be an issue. And certainly in particular, if it is a, if it is a residential unit. So yes, that's being considered. Uh, we're currently looking at um, uh, transparency requirements in the 50 to 60% range. Um, which is pretty typical for our for our higher intensity mixed use zone districts. Um, for a residential unit, uh, a couple of things may apply. It may have a slightly lower transparency requirement, but we're also looking at a residential setback, meaning that if there was a dwelling unit at the ground floor, it would actually have a larger setback so that there was enough space to create that transition between uh, between the public right of way and that private space in the unit, so we're trying to take a two pronged approach there to make sure that those uh, any ground floor residential units would have sufficient privacy uh, and separation. Uh, let's see. Go ahead, Sarah. I was going to say, there's, we've gotten a couple of questions about the clover leaf, and that was actually something we were going to mention in the next steps, because there is a project that the Department of Transportation Infrastructure is leading right now to look at evaluating sort of the best outcome and a more efficient mobility network, as uh, well as looking at creating more efficient land use for potential development with the clover leaf. So, uh, I'll pull up that slide kind of towards the end. Um, there is a website to visit for that, but uh, I might have to reread some of the questions to address kind of the exact question, but um, there is a project addressing that right now. Yeah, and I saw a few other questions also about the design standards and guidelines, Sarah. So there were questions about who would develop those and then how will those be, be governed or administered over time? So currently um, design standards and guidelines in particular for this area would be developed by the city. They would be um, community planning and development rules and regulations. So they would essentially complement and dovetail with the zoning review and they would be um, administered by city staff uh, as part of the site development plan process. So as a project um, is proposed and comes through the city for the various permits that design, those design standards and guidelines would be um, administered by city staff as part of that process. Um, we will be releasing, once we have prepared a draft of those design standards and guidelines, we will make those available for public review and comment. Um, that's still a little ways out uh, for us, but, but certainly you know, that will, those will be posted to the website and we will be advertising the availability of that draft for your review and comment. So the intention would be that there would not be a separate uh, board of any kind that would administer those. They would be administered by city staff. And if I can call on Owen, if he is out there, um, there was a question about open space. Uh, and how it can be ensured that it's accessible uh, to everybody around the, uh, around the year and not just on game days. Uh, if there is something that you could talk a little bit about from uh, Denver Parks and Rec background um, to explain the open space requirements, um, that would be terrific if you're available. Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's critical to us to ensure that the open space that gets provided in the stadium district functions as public open space and that it mates with the rest of our open space network. Uh, so I think we have a couple tools as we, some of the ones that Sarah alluded to during the presentation. So the infrastructure master plan um, being hopefully the next one that comes down the pike, which is um, re refines some of the mass, some of the open space guidance from the master plan. So the development team will be required to show sort of the locations um, and the character of those open spaces. And part of that uh, understanding is which of these are day-to-day -day open spaces um, that will be, you know, like a regular park. Um, and if there's anything that they are envisioning that is, you know, restricted or has any sort of limitations related to game day uh, activities that that would be spelled out in the IMP. Uh, the development agreement is the other tool where we would be 
sort of putting together the nuts and bolts um, to ensure that we have open space that's open to the public in perpetuity. So I think those are the, the um, two tools that we'd be using to ensure that we have clarity um, and, and teeth so that these are indeed open spaces and that we, that we have a common understanding of what is um, gonna be a, a, what I would consider like a normal, a normal park. Great, thank you, Ron. Let's see. Um, uh, Jean just posted, there was a question about the West Side Stadium Community Coalition uh, and Jean Granville just posted some additional information in the Q&A. So I'm going to um, type a response to that. And that should now be hopefully visible uh, in your Q&A tab for more information about the West Side Community Coalition. Let's see, what else do we have in here? Uh, there was a question about um, the height, uh, the, the height ranges that were being proposed and a question that says, is, why is the high end of the lower height district higher than the low end of a medium height district? Um, and really what we were, what we were trying to show there was just a range of potential building heights that could be appropriate for those areas. Um, to be clear, the you know this what we do as the city is we want to make sure that we have appropriate plan guidance and policies in place to be able to evaluate a future rezoning request. And the future rezoning request comes from the applicant, so the city will not be doing the rezoning here. Um, the the stadium district would be coming to us with a rezoning application. Uh, and their proposal as to which zone districts they would uh, they would want in those areas. And so then we will gauge that against uh, the master plan and also these kinds of conversations and the feedback we're receiving tonight. Um, so there wasn't necessarily an intention to show exactly what, what those heights could be or what those districts could be. Uh, it's really more just to try to provide a range of, of, um, of what would be appropriate. So that's probably why there's a little bit of overlap between those areas. I'll just chime in really quickly. There's been a few questions uh, related to this thing going on. Uh, it's like the COVID or something like that. But uh, so uh, their question is more or less about like how have we considered impacts of COVID on these plans in terms of, for example, like requiring non-residential active uses at the ground floor. So if there's if we're trying to encourage more retail or restaurants but maybe those are sectors in the economy right now that are not doing as well as they normally would um like how does that impact i guess our plans and future development and my response is i mean that's something as a city we are looking to address uh entire in its entirety and you know it's not just a one-off thing that we'll address it's something we'll consider in this project and kind of every other project and it will be a factor of moving forward, um, thinking about how people use the future built development, how people use roads, how people use parks, uh, and to see kind of how we can best maximize um, space, either for literally spacing out or because maybe people do need more outdoor space or want more outdoor space, or because restaurant isn't necessarily you know, a viable option for some of these ground floor tenants. So it's definitely something that will be considered moving forward. Um, we don't have a direct solution just yet. So uh, we're working on it and we appreciate feedback around that topic. And then, so there's a question about, um, I'm just look, glancing at um, some of the questions right now. Um, one was with the how is the Colfax Viaduct being integrated into the master plan? And so the just a reminder, the master plan has already been completed. So that is the guiding document for this next um, section of our project, which we're looking at what those recommendations were and what we need to do in order to set a framework 
to guide future developments. So um, in the master plan, we did recognize that there was that Colfax viaduct, uh, kind of an eyesore now, but there is also opportunity behind that viaduct if the space beneath it could be better utilized, let's say, for example, for the community, if there was if it was turned into a public space or space where maybe temporary events could happen, um, that way the, the viaduct could kind of be used as a benefit to the community. Um, and as far as we know, the, the viaduct will, will be there for some time moving forward. Um, there's a question about the design guidelines and how they might be governed. And if there's a selection process for who will be on a potential design review committee. So at the moment, um, we have a lot of different ways that we administer design standards and guidelines, and some are through either like official uh, design review boards um, or other entities would be involved, or we also do staff administered design review. At the moment, we have more or less discussed about uh, the potential for staff administered design review. So that would be kind of um, someone would submit plans and it would be city staff that would review them to ensure compliance with the des design standards and guidelines and would have that back and forth with the applicant. Of course, nothing is set just, just yet. So uh, there could be potential for that process to change depending on how it really comes to fruition. Sarah, can I jump in with a couple view plane questions that I'm seeing and I, I want to make sure that there's an answer uh, to a couple different perspectives here. One is that um, a, a question that this is somehow an exception of the view, view plane rules. And so if somebody could clarify if something, um, uh, the decision that still has to be made about that. And another question about the view from the west of downtown um, and whether or not that has any protection or um, language about it. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in on that. So um, it's uh, it's true that there currently there is no exception for this area except for the stadium building itself, uh, and so that is a future that's a future decision and a future conversation about uh, what portion of this site, if any, um, should be allowed to exceed that view plane height, and in exchange for whatever those neighborhood benefits. Um, need to be so that's again that's a future future conversation that we have not um, we have not started yet in, in uh, not in a robust fashion uh, you know certainly the master plan lays out a vision for a complete neighborhood and a number of things that would be supportive to not only this location but certainly all of the neighborhoods around within this region uh, and so in order to achieve some of those goals, there is a fairly substantial level of development capacity um, that needs to occur. Uh, in addition, the, the, a lot of the revenue generated through that development, <clears throat> if not most of that revenue generated by the development, will be fed back into the stadium itself. Uh, and um, that's, that's in order to, to continue to maintain it and to meet those, those maintenance requirements over the next 20 plus years. Uh, as opposed to trying to go back out to the to the community and ask for additional tax dollars uh, to to fund that maintenance or to build an entirely new stadium. So that's really the um, the underlying goal from the stadium's perspective uh, is to generate revenue to help pay for that maintenance. And so trying to strike that balance between um, you know generating that much uh, that much money and capital to be able to do that, also to provide these neighborhood benefits, how does that balance out with the view plane? So lots of lots of deep discussions uh, still to come for that. And then anyone's view of downtown from the west is not protected by a view plane, right? Uh, that is correct. And, and you know, it should be very, um, it should be very uh, important to clarify that the, the view planes uh, exist to protect views from public spaces. Um, typically, they're parks or other public locations, so they they are not related to anyone's private view um, from their from their home or from their apartment or you know their building. Uh, it is it is strictly a, a public resource. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, 
let's see, flipping through. Uh, there was a question about um, what agreements are in place with the Denver Housing Authority for the affordable housing being built in, in this area or in the same neighborhood. Uh, and Andrew Johnston from Host uh, Housing and Stabi or Housing Stability Department uh, is here, um, and he could he could chime in on that. Um, and so, Andrew, if you are available, that would be a good one for you to tackle. Good morning, or good evening, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. Feels like morning, doesn't it? It does. Um, uh, so, my name is Andrew Johnston. I'm with the Department of Housing Stability. Um, there, there, there has been a lot of good conversation between um, the stadium and DHA in regards to trying to support each other's act, uh, activities of redevelopment. I am aware of, a, I'll call it a, um, a, a transfer of ownership on two parcels of land to help facilitate um, the redevelopment at Sun Valley. Um, so I know that that is an agreement that exists and is out there. Um, but other than that, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, DHA city to um, uh, agreements to provide um, affordable housing at the site we're talking about today. Um, we do have a, an agreement with DHA um, where we um, have asked them to basically use some of the funds uh, from the dedicated housing fund in order to support affordable housing units being constructed across the entire city, um, of which many of them will be put in the Sun Valley location, which is just to the south. So that is, a, that is one agreement that the city does have with DHA, which is near this site, but it's not on the site that we're talking about. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. Great, thank you, Andrew. Let's see, I'm looking through. There's some questions about um, and, and comments on the timing. Uh, certainly there are some folks that can't wait to see these parking lots uh, go away and others that are just curious about the overall timing. Um, that is a very good question. And as you, as you might imagine, the, the COVID and changes in the economy are, are um, you know, making things uh, fluctuate and making things a little bit uncertain. Um, so from the city's perspective, from our, the work that we are doing, uh, we, you know, we are continuing forward with uh, if we need to make any amendments to the Denver zoning code and also to develop these design standards and guidelines over the next couple of months. Uh, ultimately, then that would need to go through the legislative review process, both with planning board uh, and with city council. That could happen conceivably, uh, you know, as early as maybe six to nine months from now to be completed. Um, however, the, the applicant, again, as, as we clarified earlier, the applicant or the property owner is ultimately the one that applies for that rezoning. Uh, we have not received a formal rezoning request from the stadium district at this point. Um, and it's really up to them uh, as to when they, they move forward with that. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned in the presentation, there is also the development of the infrastructure master plan uh, that needs to occur and uh, also the negotiation of the development agreement and any side community benefits agreements as well. So those all will take a considerable amount of time. Um, and that really just establishes the baseline. Uh, then it, uh, the stadium would actually have to move into the construction of some of that infrastructure uh, and then ultimately into the actual vertical construction of buildings uh, uh, upon which they would have a development partner uh, doing a lot of that work. So um, it's, you know, in all likelihood, it's probably uh, a little ways out before anything's, uh, anything's going to happen. And that's just the nature of these very large uh, redevelopment projects. Uh, they take a very long time. Uh, and certainly the, the pandemic has added some com uh, complexity to what is already a very, a very challenging and complex um, site uh, to, to work with. So I think, you know, for those that want to see these parking lots go away tomorrow, 
Um, sad to say it's, it's probably not imminent, um, but uh, uh, hopefully it's not too far down the road. I said there was a few questions talking about uh, additional development rights and what the city is getting in return. Um, will affordable housing be required? Will park space be required? And so that's something that we just very briefly touched on in the presentation about how those things might come to fruition. So the master plan did identify sort of that policy and framework moving forward of what the community would like to see, which included the desire for affordable housing as well as parks and open space and a quality um, mobility infrastructure network. And so the affordable housing, if we haven't already mentioned before, it, it would be accomplished through a development agreement that would be tied to the rezoning. And parks already have a certain percentage that are required as just part of the uh, large development review process. So um, there's at least a 10% minimum requirement. Um, and as the stadium has shown us in the conceptual plan that I flashed on the screen, uh, they're also providing what appears to be more than that 10% that would be required. So there will be things in return for that increase in um, building intensity and entitlement. And yeah, so hopefully that answered that question. Sarah, if I can um, just chime in, that was one of the big sticking points for Councilman Lopez as well, was to make sure that if something um, this dramatic was going to be built in what has previously been one of the lowest income neighborhoods in Denver, there was absolutely going to be benefits to that community, to the larger West and Northwest Denver communities. And so um, that's, that, that's top of mind. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Gene and the entire uh, community uh, coalition who've been meeting about this have been really trying to be specific about um, uh, what does that actually look like and what are some of those things that um, count as benefits in, uh, in this negotiation um, with, the, with the owner, with the developer, um, and a lot that's still got to be determined, but um, I'm, I'm really confident in the community members that are there. And I saw a question earlier about who is the coalition. Um, and Jean, I know you're still on and you're able to talk. Um, I, I, wonder if, I wonder if you might describe some of the nonprofit and kind of resident partners that are uh, part of that coalition. Sure. Um, am I on? Yes, you are. Oh, we can hear you. Um, yeah, uh, you know, many of us were on the initial steering committee. That that was kind of the core. And um, at the time, uh, uh, Paul Lopez was our councilman, and so he, uh, we we were just uh, concerned, many of us, um, about making sure that uh, all of these great possibilities were actually brought to fruition fruition and that the benefits that were being um, kind of uh, talked about or inferred in the plan, uh, that the priority benefits that the community really saw would be implemented and that they would be um, implemented as part of the entire development, not just saved for some time, you know, long down in the future. And that, you know, we would have a way to uh, memorialize uh, the community benefits that were um, important in that agreement. Uh, over a period of time and so that they wouldn't get lost in the 10 or 15 year build out. And so uh, um, actually it was Paul Lopez that brought to us, Councilman Lopez at the time, um, brought to us the idea of a community benefits agreement. So um, we have nonprofit we have nonprofits, we have uh, two of the uh, local um, business improvement districts um, that are adjacent to uh, the, the stadium district, as well as a number of um, non nonprofits, the Denver Housing Authority, um, service providers, and of course, um, most important is our residents, uh, some of whom share both uh, business uh, titles as well as nonprofit and other service uh, um, uh, positions. So, so it's, it's just really important that um, we have been meeting, we have work groups, we've really um, taken some pretty deep dives into things, and we're anxious 
to really share that with the community uh, because the benefits, um, just like the impact of the stadium district, um, really belong to the entire west side. Um, obviously, it's in the Sun Valley um, neighborhood, which has been very under-resourced for very many years. Um, we are seeing some tremendous changes and part of it from, from uh, the Denver Housing Authority with the Choice neighborhood. Uh, but we just want to make sure that the neighborhood is really connected throughout the neighborhood, that it is economically and culturally diverse, and that um, a lot of the great points that we have had over a number of years in terms of that culture and diversity um, are preserved and honored, um, and that the uh, really, the, the community benefits get to those folks, um, both within Sun Valley and on the west side, who, who really need um, those opportunities the most and have historically not been really uh, able to access those in a very um, convenient kind of way. Thank you, Jean. And Lindsay Miller just chimed in that um, she wanted to say that the West Side Community Coalition is hoping to involve other West Denver neighborhoods with the work on the CBA. So if you're interested in knowing more or getting involved, this is the email, westsidestadiumcc at gmail.com. Thank you, Lindsay. Great. Um, we've got a couple more. I'm uh, responding to several in the Q&A, so take a gander and look through that to make sure um, make sure that that is uh, is coming through, and you have a chance to read through those. Uh, let's see. I can uh, chime in with a question. Um, the question was, when will the IMP be finalized, and when are the public meetings surrounding that? Um, so the IMP, the Infrastructure Master Plan, is an applicant-driven submittal, so something that the property owner developer creates and submits to the city, so that is dependent on their schedule. Uh, there has been one Infrastructure Master Plan that's been submitted to the city, but it has been sort of a very high-level draft document, and typically with any sort of development process, there's more than one submittal. Um, so we don't know exactly when something like that would be finalized. Um, but typically how it goes is we will get a submittal and we will submit comments and feedback and there will be some back and forth. Um, so unsure on when that would happen, uh, that is dependent on the stadium district and the progress with their development. Um, and then the other part was the, pub, um, the public meetings that would be surrounded around an IMP. As of right now, typically the infrastructure master plan is sort of a process that's between the city and the developer or property owner, and there aren't necessarily required public meetings around that, but we had some comments in the chat. Uh, I believe we had answered, I think uh, one comment was from Joel Noble about seeing like if there is a way to engage people around that type of infrastructure, around the mobility network and whatnot. So I think that's something we definitely consider in terms of how is that communicated and figured out. Um, and I know, I think, um, as we're all aware now, the West Side Stadium Community Coalition has been, you know, talking and getting together. And um, I think we'll eventually be connected with the stadium district in terms of what the desires are for the community and um, with hopes to also maybe influence what could be identified in the infrastructure master plan. It's hard to talk and read questions at the same time. So apologize for any pauses <laughs> in between. And also I heard there was a, a mic issue at some point with my mic, so I apologize. I'm working with an old desktop computer, so I'm trying to figure out technology. I like one of the questions that came through. Um, uh, and this might go to host just in terms of um, your process uh, that you envision happening. 16% uh, of West Denver's households were displaced in 2015 to 2018. So there's a significant need for affordability at many different levels, um, all the way between Denver Housing Authority's public housing and the price points of new construction. Will CPD be working with host to identify housing needs that articulate affordable need? 
And Andrew, um, maybe you can describe how you do this with new development, how you engage in this conversation. Um, and there was an earlier conversation about why aren't we requiring affordability? And if you can touch on that briefly as well. Sure, I'm glad to do that. Um, so just as a, as, a, as a framework for the conversation on affordable housing, it is definitely something that's a priority for not only the, uh, the mayor and city council and the city staff to find affordable housing and create those units uh, versus uh, working within the framework of what we have as the what's the law right now, right? Which is there is a linkage fee ordinance that calls out what is the, the guideline. However, there's an opportunity that um, we engage with uh, the developers of sites across the city where we enter, we look, ask them if they'd be willing to enter into voluntary affordable housing agreements. And in those uh, conversations, they are truly negotiations where we try to strive to look at what is uh, the neighborhood uh, need? What are those uh, price points that are necessary? Um, do we need family units? Do we need smaller units? Um, and try to bring that and meld it together. And it is an iterative conversation um, we're going to, we engage with, uh, with the community, we'll engage with the developer and as host, as before we get to the zoning, we try to come to an agreement, looking at what are all the attributes of the development, the things that, uh, the community is looking for and try to meld that all together in, in particular in the affordable housing aspect as to how can we bring some affordable housing units to actually get built as this development's coming forward. And that is um, what we do in host now is we look to enter into these voluntary affordable housing agreements and we'll set out um, percentages of what it is that we would like to see as a percent of the development uh, being dedicated to affordable housing. Jamie, did that kind of get to where you were uh, wanting me to answer? I think it is. And um, what often comes up in, in the questions about why is it voluntary and um, uh, carrot and stick situation when it comes to Colorado and Denver's landscape? Uh, what, what makes it voluntary? Um, and it kind of goes to what I alluded to before. There is a, a linkage fee ordinance in the city and county of Denver that states what um, the builders do have the opportunity legally available to them to um, just either pay a linkage fee or do something called a build alternative. And that build alternative plan um, does not nearly yield um, what it is that we are as a community seeking out of development. And when we find that we pull these partnerships together, we're able to um, get those, what's called a voluntary affordable housing agreement. And that's where we have the larger results and it is totally voluntary. Um, they're um, looking to do this at, at the same time by looking at what the economics are for their project and looking also to what the balancing, what kind of open spaces may be required um, and also balancing what is, what's needed in the community. So that's um, why it's called a voluntary affordable housing agreement. And maybe what I'm um, alluding to Andrew is Telluride and kind of the larger restrictions about anyone really requiring affordable housing. Um, I know that that, um, uh, that often becomes a confusing point sometimes. Uh, sorry about that. Yes, uh, <laughs> there is a, a state law um, that basically we, we are not able to do rent control. I'm not very well versed in this, unfortunately. I'm relatively green in host, so I don't know the Telluride case personally. Um, but it basically says that these voluntary affordable housing agreements is, is the ways that we go about getting the um, affordable units and getting them dedicated because we can't by state law dictate rent control um, anywhere in the state because of the way that our, sta our state statute is established. Elvis, I saw you come in. Did you want to mention something? Yeah, absolutely. I could touch upon the Telluride decision and why Thank state you. law uh, <laughs> does not does not require make does not allow us to make affordable housing a requirement. Um, basically, that the, the law we can't have an inclusion inclusionary housing zoning um, inclusionary zoning in the city based on the Telluride 
uh, decision. So that's kind of the barrier as to why we cannot require developers to have affordable housing. Um, we can negotiate it in terms of if yes, and voluntary, and if they take a subsidy from the city to build their affordable housing, but we cannot um, by law, state law, require any developer to build affordable housing units um, on their property. And I think what comes into play here, Sarah and, and Christopher and every, everyone, whoever wants to chime in, um, for me really becomes um, what, what are the give and takes that different processes have to go through? And as a, as a council member who represents uh, the Sun Valley neighborhood as one of the eight neighborhoods in District 3, um, really trying to make sure I understand the council decision making points, um, which include not just rezoning, but also the view plane um, as uh, uh, what we have to offer um, and what we have to make decisions uh, around um, wanting to make sure that we, we see the gives to, uh, to community, not just in um, affordable housing, but also business opportunity in um, public space and access. Um, uh, what I what I know growing up in in this area as well is really wanting to see um, uh, green and families and people where there's concrete. Um, and and what what else can we do to make sure that that happens for families that live there, for families that enjoy. Um, and really want to see the plat return to something that, that they can enjoy as well. So there's a lot at stake here. And um, uh, we're all, I think, trying to, to figure out what do we, um, what are the levers that, that, that we each have in all of our respective spaces to try to ensure that we have um, the most access possible. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chime in very quickly because I know, you know, the communities concern because they want to get certain things out of this development. Everyone wants great things for their neighborhood and community. And I think that's that's kind of a constant struggle, not only in the city of Denver, it's, you know, cities across the nation or even across the world is how do we get that balance between, you know, what we're requiring um, and what gets done. And, you know, the city kind of comes in at that standpoint of identifying like what is at least the minimum that should be done, what has to be done to really satisfy development for the city and to really encourage the things that we want to see, um, while also still allowing that flexibility for certain property owners and developers. And I would say, you know, it's something that we are challenged with every single day. And so we appreciate all the different feedback. And I'm telling you, we're, we're going to try our best to, to ensure that you know the community gets what they've envisioned in this area with and hopefully other areas um and then lastly the other thing that i'll chime in is you know i would hope that developers are also trying to do the right thing um and there are a lot of great developers out there that want to do that so there's others that are not doing that as much um hence why we have the minimum standards but uh, developers are also faced with that challenge of how can they build a good development, but also how can they do that with their current financial structure that they have and how can they you know, bring that to fruition um, with their um, finances and, and with you know, their planning and their team. So I think kind of everyone's challenged at this point. So I, I do look forward to future conversations to figure out how we can really get those community benefits and um, really implement the, the development we'd like to see. thought I saw at some point maybe someone raised their hand to speak, so I'll just double check. Um, I think uh, there's Jean Granville, if you had another comment, um, and then there's a Miles Tangelin that I will put on deck to speak next. I think there's a couple folks that signed in under Jean's. Oh, yeah, there. I think, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, this was Sue. This is Sue. Oh, okay. uh, hi. Powers. Sorry. Um, we, we we're, we're learning our lesson on this with this technology here, but there are a lot of Gene Granville's here tonight, so it's great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment also just for, for people that are that are on this Zoom that uh, there are a lot of people whose names we've never heard of before, and and as we're uh, and and it's really and it's great, and and we really, I do really encourage you to to um, get involved with with the Westside Community Coalition and uh, um, follow up with that 
well, on the email that's there. But in terms of affordable housing, that's also a very high priority as part of the community benefits agreement. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we want to be, um, we want to make sure that those issues that have been mentioned in terms of addressing some of the displacement impacts uh, from the west side, that we have the opportunity to try and provide that housing on the site here. So we're, so we are, we are um, working very hard to, to um, come up with, with uh, what we think are economically viable. Um, and since I'm a developer, I'm really paying attention to that. Um, but I'm also paying attention to what the community needs are. And I think that there is, there is a way to make those, those mesh. And, um, and one, and the, the thing I wanted to mention also is that um, what we've heard from the community is that, you know, um, 450 square foot studio units is not really going to address the need. So our focus is on making sure that there, there are two and three bedroom units as well. And, you know, not tons, but, you know, that they're in there um, because that's really what the, what, what is reflected as a need in the community. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to allow, there's Miles Tangelin, just give you a heads up if, if you want to unmute yourself and provide any feedback. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just, I, I was involved with this. I, I, I've been following it for a while, but um, haven't been dealing with it at all lately. So a couple of questions. Uh, can you tell me if this is going to be TIF funded or maybe that's not been determined yet? Um, and some other questions I have is considering it's a parking lot and you're giving them uh, development zoning, couldn't they just opt into the development zoning, which requires the affordable housing? Um, because it's basically you're giving them development rights. Um, and uh, do, if you are not going to be, um, well, I guess the plane, the, the uh, view plane will be dealt with later, but does this development have any other exemptions that you're planning at the moment, um, like parking or anything that will be reduced for this development? And then um, another question is, with the development of the River Mile right across the river from this area, are there any neighborhood protections because we've got uh, Denver infill just being talked about now and it's gonna basically allow multifamily housing and all single family zoning. And in an area like this with a development like this and especially with River Mile, it would be the perfect opportunity for developers to come in and just start taking down the houses and building multifamily homes there because they have more value. And, um, and if anything to the requirements, and I know this would be in the developer agreement for the neighborhood, some long-term um, benefits for the neighborhood. And then will the open space be private? Will that, will that be the developer's land or will that be the city's land to maintain and take care of? Those are all great questions. I tried mm -hmm. to write down a few of these. Uh, I think I might delegate a few. I'm just going to give city staff a heads up so they can think about their response. Um, some of these questions, I will admit, are a little advanced in terms of the phase that we're in and also the phase that the developer's in. I think maybe some of these we don't quite know, so our answers just might be a little bit more in speculation of. Um, but I'm not sure if Tris Trissa Murphy has a, a response to the TIF. Um, and then maybe Owen Wells can chime in a little bit later to talk about the parks and the ownership structure. And then I can just chime in with the, you know, your question about River Mile and this development and kind of both are developing areas that are currently undeveloped or parking lots um, or another use. And, you know, they're coming in with something that might add a lot of value and would then therefore impact the adjacent neighborhoods. and. I think as we've heard from the community today, like that, that is, is definitely a concern um, of this development and some of the concerns were just mentioned with displacement is like what's equitable, what can be put in this development that contributes back to the community. But then there's that other idea that these developments could increase the other property values and then people might want to redevelop their own site if I understood that correctly. And so with that, um, we have this great tool called the Denver Zoning Code and that's part of what our discussion was about today. And uh, people are still held accountable to what their zoning is for their current property. 
And if other people wanted to rezone their property, they would still have to meet all of the review criteria that we go through um, for any map amendment in general. So just because we might see development here doesn't mean that that will trigger everyone to be able to do kind of whatever they want with their property. Uh, there's still the rules and regulations in place. Um, and so I will mention one of the review criteria of someone rezoning their property is to make sure that they're in conformance or compliance or meets the plan policies, um, whichever plans apply to that site. And so that was part of our discussion today with the stadium district is we're looking at this master plan, uh, the Decatur Federal Station Area Plan was also developed um, and West Area Plan will be developing. And so these plans are identifying maybe the desire or need for additional housing or these other things that we discussed today um, where some people would say, yeah, we would be okay with taller buildings um, if these things were provided. And that was kind of a discussion we had in the master planning stage. Um, so any rezoning that also would happen in the stadium district sites uh, would have to follow the guidance of the stadium district master plan. So um, that's just a, a quick summary on rezoning. And then I might hand it over uh, whoever is ready to answer next. I don't know if uh, Owen or Trista would like to chime in on some of the other questions or if Christopher wants to chime in with my response as well. Sure, I can talk part of the zone. I can do quick perks if you'd like. Great, thanks Owen. Yep. Um, so at the moment, there hasn't been any discussion about, um, you know, sort of a city owned and managed park, but that those details um, need to be codified in the infrastructure master plan. Uh, and then the development agreement. If it turns out to indeed be privately owned but publicly accessible open space, the city has a variety of tools that ensure that this needs to be publicly accessible open space in perpetuity, including um, uh, some zoning requirements that establish property um, restrictions that have to go with it. But we would also spell that out in the development agreement um, once we have, you know, a, a, once the applicant is back and we have an IMP um, discussion, we'll be able to answer those um, more explicitly, but that's typically how it happens. We have a variety of types of park space throughout the city. Some is publicly, some is publicly managed and some is privately managed, but in either case, we want to make sure they meet uh, appropriate park and open space standards and that the network feels public. And then, yeah, I'll just chime in. So I don't know if anyone was able to attend the community information meeting that the stadium district had quite some time ago. Um, that's where they presented their conceptual plans. And then in August, they had a sort of a virtual presentation where they presented any updates to the plans. And that's where uh, the, essentially the developer talked about maybe the ideas behind some of the open space and what they were looking at doing um, so that if you're able to attend it, great. Otherwise, um, you know, we can help see if we can get those documents to you. I think they might actually be on the stadium district's uh, webpage right now. So our webpage, our project webpage. Um, so we'll make sure that's up there. If not, we'll try to share what was presented at that public meeting. So, so if I could follow up quickly. So again, um, the neighborhood plans, I was part of the MPI. Um, it requires, a uh, Denver Blueprint requires missile, mi missing middle housing. So the neighborhood plans have to approve missile, missing middle housing. Denver Infla, and it's undefined, except to say it's multifamily affordable housing. But Denver Infill, the text amendment they're just starting on now, is going to decide whether that's duplex, triplex, and quadplex in each neighborhood context. So my point is, if, if this development goes in, the adjacent neighborhood real estate will become very valuable. And because they will then be allowed to build multifamily housing, how will these neighborhoods be protected from just totally being redeveloped into duplexes, triplexes, or quadplexes because of the adjacency of River Mile? Yeah, so I can help answer that really quickly. And what you're getting at is actually what will be addressed in that Denver infill project. And they will look at and have outreach for what those solutions should be. So I think your concern is definitely 
a legitimate concern, but it will be something addressed in that process because I think they don't want to allow people to just go ahead and build what is perceived as missing middle, but then that could happen on essentially every property. Um, I would guess there would be some level of criteria. There will be uh, context sensitivity, uh, context sensitivity, um, as well as uh, looking at what uh, parcel sizes are, location, and all of that. So I think that will all be considered in that project. Um, and I guess we can just look forward to when that happens. As of right now, you know, we still have our current zoning, and there's nothing in the zoning right now that helps address missing middle housing citywide. And that's hence why we're looking at it right now. So um, stay tuned, I guess, for that project to get started. Yeah, and I just want to, I just want to do a quick time check. We're we've actually reached seven o'clock, uh, and I know that um, I, I'd like to allow just one more one more question um, uh, verbally. Uh, Rafael Espinoza, I will allow you to talk here briefly. Well, first off, thank you. Hello, Christopher. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> um, thank you guys for continuing on with this project. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, I, I realized that I could actually comment, sorry, rather than keep putting them comments and questions. Um, the, so I want the people that are attending to realize that the, the, the square, every square foot that goes above gets built above the view plane is prized and the most valuable square foot of this proposal. And that's because it will have protected views of downtown and uh, both of and into the stadium. There's no accident that the placement of the tallest buildings is adjacent to the structure. Um, and so that's what, that's the premium that is being sought here. And so so I just, I just want everyone to be mindful of that, is it's not just they're violating the view plane because that makes sense from a, from a form standpoint. It's because nothing else, except for maybe a area, but nothing in the river mile, nothing else in that cone of the view plane can go above that. So the, the views of downtown will be perpetually preserved for this uh, breach, unless something happens. And then, I, I, but I do want to compliment um, the questions that have been raised and the con concerns, particularly on affordable housing and that question about um, dedication, because I do find it ironic and I do think this needs to be worked out and probably is in the development agreement. Um, you know, right now the stadium clears the, you know, the snow and does the paving of all of that, um, of that land and the city has some stake, but if, new streets are being built and new public you know, open space is being provided. Is it getting dedicated back to the city and now suddenly the city now has a responsibility to maintain egress and access um, through uh, a new development? Um, it just seems, it seems strange. So, but thank you all. Um, thanks for the time. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, and I, uh, I can touch on that just quickly as far as the dedication. So, um, it's true that if the, you know, if streets are built as part of this project, which they will be, uh, ultimately those will be dedicated public right of way. Um, the, the maintenance of those streets, uh, certainly it, it, there's, a, there's a strong desire from the stadium uh, uh, investment corporation's perspective that um, they would like to use some enhanced materials, some custom elements, things that would be outside of our typical city standards. So, in that situation, it would not be a burden upon the city's maintenance uh, and capabilities. So anything that would be above and beyond any of the city standards, that would need to be managed by a separate maintenance uh, division or a separate maintenance district that would be established to do those kinds of things. So um, it, is a, it, is a, it is a balance. Um, private streets or privately owned streets uh, create other problems with law enforcement response and fire response and emergency access. So we want these streets to be publicly dedicated and public right of way, but you raise a great uh, comment about the, about the maintenance of those and particularly if they're using any sort of special materials and things like that. Um, so those are, those are definitely details to be worked out, um, but that's a great comment that's noted. So Sarah, if you wanna finish 
finish us off here. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So the, we just have the last few slides of reminder. Um, so we did take a live polling today, but we still recommend that you go to the website, uh, Denver denvergov.org slash stadium district and take the survey there. There's also another opportunity to submit additional questions or comments um, to us. And then also we'll be updating that website with additional information. Um, I think, you know, schedules have been moving for everyone during this time. So I would just say, you know, keep out, keep a look out on the webpage um, and we'll try to stay in contact as much as, as we can. And then in addition to that, I know this meeting today was conducted in English. We didn't have any requests for uh, Spanish interpretation, but we will have translated materials into Spanish that will be posted to the webpage. So if you do know of anyone uh, that would like you know, those materials or would like to be involved, would like to take the survey, we will have that translated to Spanish on the website. Um, and then we already discussed this a little bit, but just quick plug in, uh, there is the West Area Plan that's ongoing right now. And uh, we really encourage you to get involved uh, in that plan as well, because um, it covers this area of the neighborhood. And then we also mentioned this project, the Colfax and Federal Interchange Transformation Project. So this is the one being led by Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. And if you visit this webpage there, you can learn more about this project. Again, all these materials will be available on our webpage. We'll have the links to these websites and whatnot um, there. So with that, we really, really thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Um, your voice is very important to be heard. And we appreciate you making the effort today to show up, to be informed, and to also be heard. So we hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And we will upload as much information as we can to the webpage, uh, including additional answers to the questions that may have not been addressed today. So thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.